The United States and North Korea continue to meet at high levels today, trying to bridge their differences and to pave the way for a summit between President Trump and North Korea's leader Kim Jong Un. Foreign Affairs correspondent Nick Schifrin reports. In a Manhattan high-rise, the U.S.'s top diplomat and North Korea's top envoy began the day with a historic handshake. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and North Korean senior aide Kim Young-chol took no questions before two and a half hours of meetings, two hours shorter than expected. Pompeo said their teams made quick headway, setting the right conditions for a summit. The conditions are putting uh, President Trump and Chairman Kim Jong-un in a place where we think there could be real progress made by the two of them meeting. It does no good if we're in a place where we don't think there's real opportunity to place them together. We've made real progress towards that in the last 72 hours. The main condition, trying to convince North Korea to reverse decades of policy of considering nuclear weapons the best way to keep the country safe. I believe they are contemplating a path forward where they can make a strategic shift, one that their country has not been prepared to make before. Pompeo and Kim started their talks last night with a working dinner of filet mignon and sunset toasts. Kim Young-chol is considered Chairman Kim Jong-un's right-hand man. He was also the country's notorious spy chief, blamed for a 2010 attack that killed 46 South Korean sailors and a 2014 cyber attack on Sony Pictures. He's on a U.S. sanctions list and needed special permission to visit the U.S. Today, Pompeo said their talks were positive, but not without challenges. I've had some difficult conversations with them as well. They've given it right back to me, too. They were decades into this challenge, and so one one not ought to be either surprised or frightened or deterred by moments where it looks like uh, there are challenges. Beyond New York, two other U.S. teams are trying to resurrect the summit. In the demilitarized zone, veteran U.S. diplomat Sung Kim is leading a team meeting North Korean officials. And in Singapore, a team led by White House Deputy Chief of Staff Joe Hagan is working on logistics, trying to make sure they're ready if the summit is back on for June the 12th. And late today, North Korea state TV announced that Kim Jong-un will meet with Russia's President Putin, but no date has been set. And Nick Schifrin joins me now, along with our White House correspondent, Yamish Alcindor. So, Nick, to you first. We heard Secretary Pompeo said there's been progress. Do we know what kind of progress? We don't know for sure, but a senior State Department official says that the U.S. needs to understand what North Korea is willing to do, or at least to pledge at this summit, and that that needs to be something that North Korea has never done before. Uh, and that means a step toward denuclearization. Uh, what, what, what does that mean? Could be shutting down a nuclear facility. They have done that before. Number two, bringing in inspectors to shut down centrifuges. We've never seen that before. And number three, what the U.S. is really hoping, shipping out some kind of nuclear material. We've certainly never seen that before. So that's what the U.S. is asking for. What is North Korea asking for? You know, intelligence analysts have always said, North Korea's priority is regime survival, and they've thought that nuclear weapons gave them that survival. So the U.S. has to replace that, replace nuclear weapons with a kind of fundamentally different political relationship. That means uh, ending the Korean War, a peace treaty. Uh, that means some kind of shift in tone. We have no hostile intent toward you, perhaps even normalization. It means mutual respect, one analyst says, take North Korea off of the terrorist uh, sponsor list. Uh, and it also means perhaps some lifting of sanctions. Uh, but, Judy, we have to remember Remember, the two sides can't even agree or haven't been agreeing on the, de de on the very definition of denuclearization or, or peace. So there's still a lot of gaps. To be so pushed. talking, talking, but still some fundamental disagreement. Yeah, especially on denuclearization. The U.S. has long said, we want instant, immediate denuclearization. North Korea says, well, we'll do it in steps. And for every step we do, you have to take another step. But we saw a little hint today that maybe the gap could be bridged. And that's when President Trump was talking this morning. He said, well, maybe we don't have to have only one summit with Kim Jong-un, maybe two summits or even three summits. And that is evidence that the administration is concerned considering that maybe this doesn't have to happen all at once, uh, and, that, um, uh, and that they're lowering some expectations for the summit. And that is hugely significant, because that does mean that this gap might be bridged. The question now, of course, is whether you can get to the point where the two sides are happy enough to proceed with this summit. Really interesting, because originally they were saying or suggesting it had to be all at once or very uh, happening uh, at, at the same time. So, Yamish, why did the president, with, with the conversations going on now, why did the president cancel the summit a few days ago? And then now everybody's proceeding as if nothing's changed. Well, that's one of the 
key questions I've been asking people in the White House. The number one question, answer I've been getting is that the, this is a president that wrote the art of the deal. This is someone who really understands negotiations and his tactics and the way that he looks at the world is that he has to be on the offense. So in this case, you saw him because the U.S. was getting very frustrated with the fact that North Koreans weren't responding to us. He decided to write this letter saying, OK, well, we don't really need this. And you guys are the ones. We have our hostages back. We have what we want. We're the ones with the big nuclear weapons. So when you come to the table, maybe we'll see you, but we don't need you. And as a result, you saw this letter. Now, the White House will stop short of saying that this is actually going to happen. I've asked the question so many times to people saying, OK, so we're back on for June 12th. They won't say yes. But the president essentially is saying, yeah, well, now that they're back on the table and I'm the one setting the rules and I'm the one in control, that I feel better about what's going, how we going forward. There's a sense of eagerness about, yeah. about making having this happen. Totally different story. Uh, the surprise announcement today, the president is pardoning the conservative writer Dinesh D'Souza. And then he's, the White House is letting it be known, the president's letting it be known that he is considering commuting the sentence of the former uh, Illinois uh, Governor Rod Blagojevich, who's serving prison time right now, and also pardoning Martha Stewart. What do you, do we know what's behind this? Well, if you ask the president, these pardons are about his sense of justice and the fact that he thinks that these people were treated unfairly. Um, there's this idea that he also has political and celebrity ties. Um, it's not really surprising that a president who obviously got his start on The Apprentice, um, and, and a lot of people know him from his reality TV days, that he has these kind of celebrity connections. So on the political side, Ted Cruz was pushing for D'Souza to get pardoned. So there's a political side to that one. But Bogoyevich um, is really about the fact that, well, at least some people think it's about the fact that he was on The Celebrity Apprentice, so the president is familiar with him. When it comes to Martha Stewart, part of my research today was watching a literal video of Martha Stewart showing Melania Trump and the president how to make a meatloaf. So they go back and, and were, they were joking about the invitation that she got to his wedding and the fact that she couldn't go because she was in prison. Um, so there's some, inf there's some there, there's something there. Then when it comes to the prosecutors that are involved, this is where I think it gets really interesting. So Preet Bharara, who was a United States attorney in New York who President Trump fired, he was the one who actually prosecuted D'Souza. And D'Souza tweeted today that karma is really kind of coming back to him because he thought that this prosecutor was trying to make his, his career on his case. James Comey was the one who prosecuted Martha Stewart. So there's always a Comey connection there. Mm -hmm. Then Patrick Fitzgerald, who was a very good friend of James Comey, was the one who prosecuted Rod Blagojevich. And this, he's also the same person who prosecuted Scooter Libby. Um, the reaction is that Democrats are saying that this is that this, the president is really out of line when it comes to these pardons because he's basically saying, I can do partisan pardons and you should, everyone should be aware because of the Russia probe. But Rod Blagojevich's wife, who has really been pressing to have her husband released from prison, says she's really encouraged by the president's words. It makes everyone wonder if there are signals that are being sent yeah. by all of this. Mm -hmm. Yamiche Alcindor, Nick Schifrin, thank you both. A lot going on today. <laughs>